I'm Brent Olson, and I'm the Managing Director of Business Development at Geographic Expeditions. And I've been lucky enough to have that job for the last 25 years. And thank you. During that time, um, uh, we've had some amazing trips and amazing experiences. But I think if somebody asked me what my favorite thing about my job has been, I would have to say traveling with and co-leading trips with Dr. Thurman. For the past 20 years, we've uh, been designing and leading trips throughout Asia uh, as fundraisers for Tibet House. And we've traveled to uh, countries such as Bhutan, Nepal, Tibet, India, Sri Lanka, Myanmar, and Mongolia. Um, and you know, these trips are really remarkable in many ways. Um, but I think that the thing that really makes them very, very special is what Dr. Thurman brings to these trips. From his encyclopedic knowledge of Buddhism and the cultures of Asia to the daily meditations and discussions that we build into these programs, these trips are truly pilgrimages. I'm happy to see so many familiar faces from past trips here in the audience tonight. And if any of you are interested in potentially joining us on future trips, there's a sign-up list um, at the, uh, in the reception area that you can put your name on and we will inform you about the upcoming journeys. In addition to um, leading these many, many trips throughout Asia, Bob is an uh, <laughs> amazingly busy guy. Uh, he's just spent the weekend um, with David Bullard uh, doing a number of talks for the San Francisco Zen Center. So how many of you were able to attend that? What a few of you. Good. Yeah, I heard they were amazing. I'm sorry I couldn't make it. But as one of the leading experts on Tibetan Buddhism, he's the founder and president of Tibet House, the president of the American Institute for Buddhist Studies, and the Jade Song Kappa Professor of Indo-Tibetan Buddhist Studies at Columbia University. He was the first American ordained as a Tibetan monk, and Time Magazine named him as one of the 25 most influential people in America. Dr. Thurman has written numerous articles and books, including Inner Revolution, Circling the Sacred Mountain, and Why the Dalai Lama Matters. His most recent book, co-authored with Sharon Salzberg, is entitled Love Your Enemies, How to Break the Anger Habit and Be a Whole Lot Happier. We have copies of that book, which are available for purchase, and Dr. Thurman can sign them again uh, during the reception afterwards. Joining Dr. Thurman tonight is our good friend, Don George, who is the editor of the GOX blog, Wanderlust, a literary journey for the discerning traveler. Don has served as the global travel editor for Lonely Planet Publications and as the travel editor for the San Francisco Examiner and Chronicle. He has published 10 books, including Travel Writing and The Kindness of Strangers. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Robert Thurman and Don George. What type of terrible things did you say, Brent? <laughs> Embarrassing things. I'm glad I didn't hear. <laughs> How is everybody? That's nice. Nice to see you all. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, Dr. Thurman, Bob, if I may. Bob, Bob, sure, Don. <laughs> uh, the, th the theme for tonight is pilgrimages, and I yes. thought I'd ask you a few different kinds of questions about pilgrimage. First of all, I know that there, there are just amazing holy sites associated with the Buddha's actual historical life. And I thought Absolutely. you might talk a little bit about some of those as, right. as places of pilgrimage. Right. Well, the Buddha himself gave that instruction uh, in his uh, Parinirvana Sutta. Uh, he said there are eight places and four places and so forth. Referring the four main places are Bodh Gaya and um, Sarnath and uh, Kapilavastu Lumbini, where he was born, and then um, Kusinagara, where he passed away. And then there's another set of eight. And right in that, he said people should come there. And it was lucky, because when he, passed, when he did pass away, there was, um, there was practically a war over his ashes. And uh, the people gathered all around in different kings, of the, because there was uh, India at that time was like Greece, you know, like Sparta, Athens, right. Corinth. It, had, it was city-states. And um, they were all struggling over getting Buddha's relics. You know. And so he, he, the Malas, I think the Malas were in the territory where Kusinagara exists. At that time, it was a kingdom called the Mala Kingdom. 
And then they diplomatically like dished out and separated the different relics of the Buddha. So the pilgrimage aspect in the sense of remembering the space in which the Buddha had lived starts from the beginning of Buddhism, actually. Mm. Like, uh, and and um, you know, the, in, the, in Europe, um, Robert Graves' famous thing, the white goddess, you know, there's right. this idea of the, that the Christian Rome and all the important Christian sites are on top of goddess temples and places around the Mediterranean. Right. And so they're prim primeval sort of things. And Buddha mentioned himself that um, the stupas that are built to enshrine his relics are the, a kind of transvaluation of king monuments, you know, like plinths or monoliths that are made to, to represent kings, because the idea is that the, the becoming a Buddha is a different kind of kingship, the king mm. of the Dharma, the king of reality, rather than king of a kingdom, of a, of a political kingdom. Mm -hmm. So it starts right from the beginning, pilgrimage. So we walk to those places to remember that and to remember our own possibility to be Buddhas. Everybody's going to be Buddhas. You people in San Francisco are closer than we in New York, <laughs> for sure. We should do pilgrimage to San we, Well, I do occasionally come here for pilgrimage and to meet you all. <laughs> and uh, you know, they're from New York City, where we're just in sort of reality. You know. <laughs> no nature, you know. no Marin County. You know. Actually, we do have a nice thing in that we have the Catskill Mountains, where we have Menla Mountain Retreat, our spa, the Tibetan med Buddhist medicine spa that we developed in there. What, what ha when you're on the Pilgrim's Trail, what, what happens to you emotionally and spiritually? Right? Well, uh, usually I feel disappointed. Because uh, you get somewhere, and it's really cracked up to be a great thing, and then somehow it's like there's somebody begging around, and then there's some problems, and there's some dogs that are underfed, <laughs> and it's like, and you know, you usually feel something. But then a few places, you really have your mind blown. And I think Bodh Gaya is one of those places, for example. And, um, and then I think uh, maybe now I appreciate other more places. The, the place that really sort of cracked open my, my rational, critical mind, let's uh -huh. say, maybe, you know, be, having been missed, I was badly educated. I was badly educated at a place, school called St. Bernard's, like a British type New York City school <laughs> where you learn Latin in the third grade and French mm -hmm. and Latin at the same time in the third grade, and then they, no girls. <laughs> and they had a switch for the back of your legs if you didn't study. Wow. Then Phillips Exeter, which is a ridiculous, preposterous sort of place right. where they just work on your brain. You still don't know what a female is at that time. <laughs> I didn't have a sister. And then Harvard. Which at the time I went there, there was a little bit mystical something about Harvard, and they weren't all puffed up with how brilliant they think they are, which they aren't. <laughs> and um, you probably have better schools out here, UCSF, Stanford, I think it's a little bit better, maybe more realistic. But anyway, I was badly educated, so, but the place that really blew my mind was Mount Kailash. Ah. And I was super disappointed when we first arrived there. Brent will remember. Where's Brent? Brent, oh, yeah. Brent will remember when we first arrived at Mount Kailash in 1995, right? And then we were forced to camp in this, in Darchen, in this horrible place, all covered with dog poop hmm. and broken glass. And they had these little rectangular, like, tent-based places. And they wouldn't let us go where the Tibetan pilgrims were. Hmm. We had to go in this special walled-in place, you know, and with a police station sort of next to it. Hmm. And I was so depressed, and we got, and because Kailash is so magical. And then I was lying down, and then uh, I wrote about this in my book, Circling the Sacred Mountain. Some of you might have read that. And I'm lying down there, and then I'm tricking out because there's light. I'm seeing light. I'm trying to sleep in this light. So I think somebody like Tad Wise or somebody <laughs> is flashing my a light on the tent, or somebody's <laughs> uh -huh. walking around. I look outside the tent, and there's nobody, totally everybody, because it gets so cold in October in that mm. area, high altitude. And, th and then I went back, and again, there was light. And then I realized that the ground was luminous. Wow. I wasn't stoned on anything, <laughs> except maybe the altitude. It was like just a no I was in a normal state of mind, and I was bummed out, actually, because I thought, oh, here we are at this holy mountain, supposedly holy mountain, this usual grubby thing with some Chinese policemen there, you know, right. and some dogs, some underfed dogs. <laughs> but actually, the land, the ground is luminous in that place. Mm. It really is a, what they call a power spot or a holy place or something, that, hmm. that mountain. It's holy to the Hindus, the Jains, the Buddhists, the Bumbos, at least four groups. You know? And um, 
from then on, that whole place, even the rocks were like alive energy. You know, they have a saying that Mount Kailash, the, the mandala of chakra, the Buddhists do, the mandala of chakra sambara, a super bliss Buddha, as I call him, is a um, super bliss machine Buddha, actually, chakra sambara, <laughs> is always open. You know, you don't have to do a powder mandala because the mandala is there. And I think I got a sense of the meaning of that because mm. it means that the rocks are a certain goddess. The water is another goddess, even in the ice form. You know, the fire is a certain goddess. The wind is another one. And um, the deities are all in the nature there, even though it's a very stark nature. Did you, have you, did you ever go there? No, I haven't seen It's that. really marvelous. You know, it's, it's the central amazing, amazing place. I even had the insight there that Buddha, in his kindness, because I then looked up in the text, and the Buddha's mother, when she conceived the Buddha, which was not a virgin conception, but it was a, there was no dad around. It was, uh, she was not, it was the, the, which is a, a mythical theme. You know, if you ever look at your Joseph Campbell or anything, the son that is born, the hero that is born without the father's element is going to overturn the patriarchal lineage. Mm. And, but there's no, in India, they don't care about virgin or not. You know, it's like not, it's not the Protestant ethic or anything. It's not Puritan <laughs> Europe. <laughs> and, uh, but in the dream, she has, so she was on a retreat in the story, and then she has a dream, and in the dream, her bed po posts are picked up by the four guardian king deities, who are a certain type of deity in the Indian pantheon, the Indian Olympus, you know. And then they take her bed, and they go to Mount Kailash. Huh. And of course, it's a mythic Mount Kailash that is like, you know, huge. It's like the central mountain. And then this, that white elephant meteor comes shooting down, which she perceives as a white elephant, but it's really like Superman. Remember Superman? He comes and crashes in the field in Kansas in something that looks like a shellfish <laughs> that Jor-El sends and you to spinning across the galaxies. Do you remember that entry to the Superman movie? You guys are deprived of good movies. I'm sorry, but there's a thing like that. And the Buddha comes like that from a higher plane in a, in a, and she sees it as a white elephant, but actually it's a kind of little pagoda capsule and then lands in her womb, you know, and she sees a white elephant merge with her mm. six tusk, the original useless thing, a white elephant. <laughs> the original, I, I've always wondered if that's where the expression white elephant comes from. Because Buddha was useless. He became a monk. He didn't serve, he wasn't the kingdom. He was the, useless. This alignment stuff is useless. It isn't producing wealth, you know, producing whatever it is. It's only helping people stay, attain freedom from suffering. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, so anyway, they took her, her, so in a way he was conceived on top of Mount Kailash. Mm -hmm. But then in his kindness, because it's such a hassle to go there, it really is a pain in the neck. So, you know, because it's the altitude and the whole thing, Garchen is 15, 16,000 feet. So then they came back to Lumbini, you know, garden, wow. you know, and, then, and they think of it as being conceived, you know, so it's her, that's where she was in her waking body, you know. So anyway. So that's the thing, pilgrimage. But now listen, Don, you <laughs> go to those 88 temples, but you go to a few of them each time, right? right, right. In Shikoku. Yes. There's an amazing thing in the southern island of Japan, not the Honshu, the root island, but the southern island, right? Shikoku. That's right, Shikoku. Where Kukai, the legend of Kukai, the great tantric who came from China and brought the tantra and brought hiragana, katagana to Japan because he knew Sanskrit as a, because he was into tantra and they were into Indian Sanskrit. And, um, and uh, he had supposedly tamed different dragons and demons yes. and things, and there are these 88 temples. Right. And it's really beautiful in that they have these beautiful walking paths, right? right? And little temples on the top of mountains where you ring a bell, and then each temple has a little guest house, and some of them have hot springs, and they give you good food, yeah. right? It's kind and of you lead the pilgrimage that. there, I, and the Buddhists <laughs> are always good at that. Like, you have right now Mount Tamalpais here and things, and at some day in the future, San Francisco being practically like a Buddhist city in America, <laughs> there'll be like walkways, and then people will add there'll be a little temple to. But here, the local Shinto deities will be crazy horse, you know, <laughs> the, you know, an incarnation of crazy horse right. or some spirit. Joe you know. Montana. What? Joe Montana. And G uh, Joe Montana. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Joe Montana. Well, that's a very good idea. Yeah, Joe Montana and uh, maybe uh, Jerry Brown. Uh, right. He right. will be a local spirit here eventually. 
And, and, and when he stopped trying to be governor again and again and again. <laughs> and, yeah, and finally, uh, may he not pass away till he had been governor at least five times at 120, because <laughs> he's a good governor, unlike That's some right. other ones. Right. And um, uh, no, really, he's going to take the money back out of the prison system and put it back into the university system where his father put it, where it belongs. And then educate people, then they won't need to go to prison. You know? right. But I'm sorry, I, know I shouldn't get into politics. That's a, well, so I'm just saying, in the future, yes. there'll be that kind of pilgrimage. And actually, where, right. where we have our Menla, there's at least 30 Buddhist centers in the Catskills. Huh. And it's going to be like a Shikoku there, north of New That's York nice. City, when there are walking paths between them. Uh -huh. you know? And of course, when you go and do it, as Don will tell you, you do these beautiful walks. And it's their time, so it's a day walk right between right. temples. Right. And then it's very, you get to where you go and you, get a, you have a white uh, coat. And then they put a stamp of each temple that you go to. And there's a room for you to have 88 stamps on there if you really want to attain nirvana, you know? Right. And uh, my wife was very skeptical about getting those stamps when we went in the 80s. Before. We, didn't, we didn't have the good fortune to go with Don. We <laughs> went with an earlier gentleman who wrote a book about it and uh, uh, was an expert on those temples. And, uh, but with, by the third temple, when we would get a little too late in the evening and they closed the booth for the stamp, which is right. called the no-kyo, she would pound on that <laughs> booth and say, I want my no-kyo. I walk here. Where's my no-kyo? And actually, we have those jackets. They're white pilgrim jackets, jackets. And there's stamps up and down them. Yeah, we have great. a few, you know. They're great. It really is really neat. And you have a special staff that you get a pilgrim staff with a little, it's like a little stupa on the top of the staff, right? A wooden right. staff. And it's really fun. And, but you get frustrated because then a bunch of Japanese come in a bus. And then they go in and you have to line up behind them to get your no-kill. And you walk. <laughs> right. And yes. they're going busing. You from should have an asterisk over your head that I walk. That's I right. Should get special That's right. But right, they still go in the bus today, the Japanese. They do. They still so do. They, they, yes, do, it. they, they do. do. They do industrial strength pilgrimage exactly. in a bus. <laughs> right. And they go to right. 20 temples in a day or right. something like that. So what was your first pilgrimage? Well, I think my first pilgrimage was when I, uh, I left Harvard as a senior in my fall semester with the plan to go to India to find out how to get properly educated about my emotions, mm. which the, the Western curriculum doesn't, doesn't manage that. But I had been reading up on Hermann Hesse and Jung and Freud and, and various things, even Gurdjieff at the time. And I knew somewhere in the East. And I really, I, uh, it's interesting, unlike a lot of my colleagues in Tibetan studies, I didn't have a Shangri-La fantasy about Tibet for some reason. I, I mean, you know, I'd heard about the Dalai Lama, and I liked that, but it wasn't my thing. Mm -hmm. so I knew India had something. I just, uh, India was the great mother for me. Huh. And so I um, had a friend who had father worked in the Ford Foundation in India. And he'd grown up going to high school there and had many tales of motorcycling around India and avoiding elephants on the roads in Tamil Nadu and things like that, you know, with his motorcycle. So we, bought motor we went to London and bought motorcycles there and started off. But then by the time I got to Greece and the Parthenon, I sold that motorcycle. I felt I should walk into Asia. And so I was this crazy fakir, you know. I had lost one eye, and I was into reality, so I didn't even wear the plastic eye. I had a patch sometimes, but mainly I just had a socket. And I had a beard, and I was like, I was truly on a pilgrimage. Yeah. And people were very nice to me in the Muslim world because they said I was a fakir. They said, oh, here comes the American fakir. Oh. At first, some people thought I was a CIA agent on a special mission, <laughs> right. of course. But most of them, because they, I was sleeping in, in, in temples and things and uh, in mosques, and they treated me like a spiritual seeker, you know. And then I finally, and I met various holy men, uh, uh, sheikhs, you know, and Sufis. I first learned to do a prostration in a Sufi tekka in, uh, in Damascus, actually, is where I first learned that. And um, I was doing whirling dervish stuff in Konya and in, and in oh. Turkey before that. Hmm. But somehow, none of the holy people really held me in a certain way, in the sense that they were holy. They were even luminous, some of them. Hmm. But they were the, it was all about them or something like that. And I wanted it to be about me. <laughs> <laughs> right. and, uh, and then I met the Tibetans in India, and somehow they seemed to have something like what I wanted. The Indians had forgotten about their Buddhism, and I knew it was Buddhism that had the real knowledge. Mm. Somehow I knew that. 
although yoga is connected to that. And Hinduism is very interwoven with Buddhism, actually, like you see it in Nepal. It was like, like that in India in ancient times. Hmm. But, the, but the Indian moderns have forgotten it, and they get all nervous about Buddhism. Oh, no, Memsab later, when I was studying there, one person, <laughs> when I was there as a graduate student, much later, one person who was um, a ma major domo, a guy called Sw uh, Swaminji, and he was a waiter, actually, kind of like the head waiter of a, of a bungalow that you went when you were in a certain thing, American Eastern Indian Studies. And he was frightened when he heard I wasn't a conventional Sanskritist, but I was a Buddhist scholar, a Buddhologist. Mm. And he almost his hands started shaking as he was serving tea to my wife. Because he was saying, why does Saab go to the other side of town, to Bandarkar Institute, instead of coming to our Deccan College here in Pune? And she said, oh, didn't you know, Swamiji, uh, my husband is a Buddhist scholar. And he like, started shaking. <laughs> he said, oh, Mem Saab doesn't Saab No, Buddhism, that's sweeper's religion. Ah. You know, like something low caste. Wow. You know? And then he sweepers was frightened to be religion. waiting on us since I was like consorting with sweepers. Sweepers, who were not all sweepers, they're a bunch of Brahmin scholars, but who, you know, but the Buddhism in, in its revival in India has oh. been picked up by the lower caste people. So the regular caste people are nervous about it, you know, because, and in Buddh when Buddhism's time in India, there was much less rigidity in the caste system, actually, because the, the Buddhist Sangha didn't, rego didn't recognize caste. And so a Brahmin who joined the Buddhist monastic order, which was huge in India for a long time, would have to be subordinate to an untouchable who had joined five minutes earlier, because that person was senior in the order. So it was Buddha's way of turning it around, you know, uh -huh. of detoxifying the phobias uh -huh. about caste. You know. uh -huh. So anyway, that was my pilgrimage. But then it's very funny conclusion to that pilgrimage. So then I saw the Dalai Lama too, giving a speech, but I didn't get to meet him. And I you know, met some Tibetans, and then I took a job to teach English in a Lama school to the, to the young Lamas who had been collected there by one lady. And, uh, but then my father died in New York. So then my mother sent me, a, after finding me, which was some difficulty, but mm. she did, and she sent me a round-trip ticket back to India because I, I was never going back to America, but I would, went back mm. to the funeral. But then while I was back at the funeral, I met a Lama, Mongolian Lama, in New Jersey. I'm a New Yorker, Manhattan. In New Jersey, I met a Mongolian Lama, and when I got to his little place, which is a, wasn't a look at Shangri-La Temple, it was a tract house in a New Jersey refugee area. It had a little wheel of his Dharma and two things painted on a piece of plywood over this little pink house. But when I got there, I couldn't walk. My knees were knocking. I had butterflies in my stomach. I thought the Lama in there must be on a dragon. There was like an energy then in there. And then my guy who had driven me there, who was really mad at me because I wanted to run away, <laughs> he dragged me in there. And then that Lama like just totally blew my mind. And I stayed with him for a year and a half. And I finally found the Dharma there with him. But of course, the first thing he told me was, you can't study the path of the Dharma. You're a crazy boy. You dressed up like an Afghani fakir here in New Jersey. <laughs> you just go back to India there and teach those lamas and something like that. But something oh. about him, the energy around him was too much, you know. It was just amazing, you know. And then he taught me Four Noble Truths. So everybody here knows Four Noble Truths, right? You've been on trips with me. You know that Four Noble Truths mean that you're supposed to be happy. And even though you're Californians, you don't necessarily convince of that. <laughs> You know, you have every opportunity here in California, but you, you think maybe you still, this is a Protestant ethnic society. We live in America, even if you're Catholic or Jewish or whatever, it's a Protestant ethnic society. No free lunch. <laughs> right. And no happiness. Happiness it might be devil's work, you know. It's illegal <laughs> to be really happy. Your partner comes home being really happy for no reason, and you, like, reach for the tranquilizer bottle. <laughs> What's wrong with them? But that Four Noble Truths are, are the prescription for happiness, actually. Nirvana, mm -hmm. that means. Nirvana means happiness. You know? mm -hmm. Anyway, I'm in, sorry. In so that was my first pilgrimage. That was your first It's a little bit lengthy. But uh, no, I'm that was good. That was it took a year. Very concise answer, actually. It took a year. <laughs> <laughs> took a year. Um, yeah, it took a year. And, and since then, you've, would you say your life has been a pilgrimage since then? Sort of, yes, I would say that. But, but, you know, then there is this idea of the tantric siddha, that the inner pilgrimage, you know, like the songs of 
Tilapa or Narapa or Saraha, that, you know, the Benares is in my heart, you know, and, you know, the Bodh Gaya is in my navel and my throat chakra is my Kailas. They have this kind of thing. Mm. So the pilgrimage then becomes finding your own heart, you know, and opening that heart with wisdom and compassion, you know. So you're pilgrimaging into your Buddha nature, let's say, let's call it like that. There's an inner pilgrimage, you know, the path, the inner path. So when, when we go in our, when I go with my fellow pilgrim, Brent Olson, without whom I couldn't go anywhere. <laughs> He's like lurking back there taking pictures now. But, and so that, which is lucky because when we go on a pilgrimage at the end of the day, we realize we went somewhere. Otherwise, we would all forget. <laughs> he shows us in a picture where we were, which is really good. And I'll say something about that, having a record of where you went. And... Um, you know, we, the outer pilgrimage is going to this and that temple and seeing this place and Mandalay and whatever it might be. But then there's an inner one where we do the pilgrimage of the heart, which the people in that culture are doing in a way, or they should be doing. And then some, some subliminal level, even the humblest person there is doing that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's really wonderful. But then think about what pilgrimage means. Pilgrimage means remembering and commemorating and keeping par as part of your life that there have been beings who have achieved a higher vision of reality and who have been, you know, in the West, maybe in a theistic religion, it's like who have become holy. And in, the, in Buddhism, it's who have become noble, what they call noble. And then they redefine noble again, not to be a class thing, but noble is a consciousness thing. The way they define noble and ignoble or noble and common, they don't rub it in that it's ignoble. <laughs> But ignoble means the person who is just out for themselves, who is just egotistical. And it's everything about them and what they need and want, and everybody else should fit in according to what they want. That's considered common. And noble is someone who's had an experience through seeking to find out what their self is actually is and where it is and what it is, where they sort of have at least a momentary a certain degree of experience of the transparency of the self, let's call it. Let's not say the absence of the self, because that, that would mislead us. There is a self, definitely, it's a re but it's a relational self interconnected with others. It isn't some absolute separate thing that's the real me that's separate from everybody, which is the core, the core of the delusion of the egotist, of the exaggerated egotist. Actually, it's good to be a bit of an egotist, excuse me. Don't think you're supposed to go and erase your ego and act like, should I go to the bathroom now or something? And if you ever go to any kind of Dharma center where they have to ask the guru whether they should go to the bathroom, like say, thank you, goodbye. <laughs> there are some like that, you know. That's no good. So you need a strong ego to want to know what the world is about. So that's actually good. We would encourage that. But the wise ego realizes that constantly worrying about how much I have and how important I am and what I've got or whatever never will make you happy. It's un totally unsatisfactory. Because when you really reflect about how much you have and what you've got, you know what the answer always is to yourself? You do know. But I'll spell it out. It's never enough. Right. It's not good enough, whatever it is. Right. When you really evaluate, right? You just had a great love affair, but was it, was it good enough? No. Mm. During the love affair, it seems to be because you temporarily don't think about how good it is. Mm. That's the whole thrill of it. You stop thinking about how good it is, and you're just in love. That's why you're happy then. But the minute you think, that's the, the end of the love affair is when you think, was this a great love affair or what? Mm. Oh, not that great. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. <laughs> right? Uh, right. Isn't that a fact? Yeah. <laughs> then, you know, then it's marriage. <laughs> Partnership. It's a job. And, it's, and of course, <laughs> there's a deeper spiritual love, of course, that can go on and on and on and on. You know, up to the golden... Diamond Jubilee, you know, mm. and then uh, and then soulmatehood, and then death, and then next time you want to find them at a younger age before you have two or three divorces, <laughs> and enjoy it at youth. That's the vow of the soulmate, mm. right? Mm. I'm sorry. So, <laughs> but that's part of a pilgrimage. That is a pilgrimage. It's beautiful. Yeah. The the loving couple they become pilgrims to each other. Ultimately. Mm. And they find the other one is, becomes a holy being to them. That's really marvelous. That's the, that's the ultimate. It really yeah. is. And that, and that comes from, as Yi Ching says, you know, marriage or partner is a partnership. It's a spiritual partnership. For each member of the 
thing respects the other's individual spiritual evolutionary goal. And they don't expect the other to serve them only in their evolutionary goal. And those, that's what really can last. You know? mm. and, and, in, and of course, in our warped, excessively patriarchal societies, I think the man has to be a little more humble about it than the woman. Mm. And the man has to take a back seat. And that's a great expression that we have, the better half. And I hope I never hear a woman say, oh, here's my better half, <laughs> <coughs> frankly. But, the, but the, and you guys, don't worry. And you can just consider I've been beaten down by a very beautiful Scandinavian <laughs> wife, you know, a Viking wife. <laughs> and uh, encountering a miserable New Yorker. <laughs> and 47 years of training, still incomplete. <laughs> <laughs> well, so that's so that's the thing. Uh, what's the I've thing? been thinking about your yeah. your pilgrimages. Yes. Um, and one place I would really love to go to is is Bhutan. And I was wondering, can oh, you right. talk a little bit about Bhutan as a pilgrimage? I can. Site place. Uh, Bhutan is what what is great about Bhutan, and um, for some reason, I had imprinted by I have taken a few people from Texas to Bhutan. And, and they call it butane. <laughs> and, and sometimes I feel like calling it butane. I don't know why. It's, just, it's kind of colorful and sweet, you know. But uh, makes them feel at home there, you know. Yeah. I'm in butane. <laughs> and uh, Bhutan is a little a BH sound. Anyway, Bhutan is a, a little sliver of Tibet. It's the only one of that and Ladakh. But Ladakh is a little bit more wrecked by modernity. Bhutan is on the process of being wrecked by modernity, that's for sure. Mm. Their gross national happiness is very, very tenuous, you know, because of the influx of modernity and a certain kind of idea of democracy and so on. And I won't get into that, but still there, you have the flavor of what Tibet really was, you know, mm. before the communists crashed into it, and it, which wasn't Shangri-La, it's not Shangri-La, but there's a there's an inner feeling in the hearts of the people where, because that culture mainstreamed Buddhism. And people don't realize that, but you know, like Thai people say, we're a Buddhist country, or Japan, they say, oh yeah, we're a Buddhist country. Mm -hmm. Some, many Japanese will say, it, Korea. Mm -hmm. But in a way, and I would used to accept that, and I accept that Buddhism is a big force, institutional force in those countries. Mm -hmm. But I, I came with a definition finally from studying the sociology and anthropology of Buddhism throughout Asian history that wherever the polity, the ruler, either a monarch or uh, you know, even, even if it's now a president in a democracy, where the main institution in that country is a military institution, and then a monastic institution is tolerated and even supported, and after the wars, the, mil the kings who have killed a lot of people conquering something, even conquering some other country's Buddha and bringing it back to their temple. They then build a bigger temple. Mm. You know? And then they, then they try to subdue and control themselves in their, their bloodlust and their wealth lust. And they, and they worship the Buddha, mm. who really wasn't happy when they were out killing people. And so that's what I call a, where Buddhism is a countercultural force. Like, in a way, Christianity has been mostly a countercultural force in its history. So therefore, it cannot be blamed for the violence that is going on in its history uh, in the name, misusing the name of Jesus, who didn't really ever say, which is a telegram I wrote to a certain White House, <laughs> Jesus never said, bomb thy enemy. <laughs> he never yeah. said that. He said, love thine enemy. Mm. And so therefore, <clears throat> Christianity is, was only, count, you know, we were a Christian country. Onward, Christian soldiers. Let's go destroy some, mm. suppose, a non-Christian crusade or something. That's where it's a countercultural force. You can't blame Christianity. The real Christians are trying to restrain that. But when the military and the ego of the ruler is still the dominant force in such a society, it's only a countercultural force. Now, in Tibet, they were tremendous conquerors. And they were, everybody was terrorized. They conquered what is now Bhutan and into Bengal further, actually. And they conquered in Ladakh, and they conquered into Nepal, mm. and in Central Asia, and they conquered the Silk Route. They even conquered China at one time. 
and they put a puppet, but they, but they never lasted where they were because they liked to live at high altitudes. Mm. And they, so they never, they were the one nice thing about them as conquerors is they didn't want to colonize anywhere outside because they loved their Tibet, you know, mm. except a little bit the Silk Route just to sort of take the taxes because they were greedy, you know, take the toll tax, you know. Mm. But uh, then they got Buddhism. And then Buddhism slowly worked its way with them, and it slowly monasticized them. And, the, and instead of being like in Japan or China or other places where every third generation the ruler would go and trim back the monastics and cut them down and take back land that had been given, you know, the, the green gulches, the, the thousands of green gulches that real aristocratic families gave when the lady of the house uh, wanted to be a nun and wanted to have a monastery would then give her land mm. to the monastery or the nunnery that happened in China. But then the, some little emperor would wake up in the third or fourth generation and he'd go to his Confucian minister and say, well, I want to make a war over here or build an extra palace. And he'd say, sorry, you're broke. Mm. What do you mean I'm broke? I have all this land, all this like wealth. No, no, it's all that belongs to the Buddhists now. Mm. <laughs> and then he would say, well, that's too many Buddhists. And he would take it all back mm. and defrock everybody. That's a countercultural thing. So Tibet a little bit did that at first. But then after about 800 years, finally, the nobles had their armies taken away. There was no longer internal wars. There was no more empire. And two or 300 years, they lost empire. Because people lost a taste for Ramboism. Mm. And the Rambos even wanted to attain enlightenment because it's more fun. You know, enlightened people have a lot more fun. <laughs> they don't have the emotional plague, what Wilhelm Reich calls the emotional plague. Mm. Do you know what that is? That's the military posture. That's like this. You know, march, march, march. Suck that pelvis back. Chop down the diaphragm by jamming your chin into your neck here. Suck in your stomach so you don't feel fear. And you certainly don't know what pleasure is. Mm. Somebody in California comes and tries to put you in a hot tub and give you a massage, and all you feel is uptight. Because <laughs> you might feel an inner streaming, and that would be frightening. You might have to shoot the massage therapist. <laughs> And uh, an enlightened person is opening that inner, those inner nervous system and the inner chakras and meditating. That's, and nirvana comes from within a liberated nervous system. It's the, it's the human being encountering their own actual cellular energy and their own health, which is the clear light of the void, which is what we call bliss void indivisible in the highest form of Buddhist, you know, what kept esoteric in the more uptight parts of Buddhism. And they call it nirvana. In the where people are still worried about being happy, so why did I start on that? Bhutan. Oh, Bhutan, <laughs> right? So, so Bhutan still has it. So then, in the 17th century, the, the it start happened spontaneously everywhere, where the religious leaders began to be reincarnated. So they, the people loved so much the teachers who helped them open up their inner heart sensitivities to their actual health, which is blissful, to the bliss of their own bodies. Everybody has, Every human being has bliss in their own body if they're open to it. And they loved them so much that they started reincarnating. And you couldn't even run for sheriff in Tibet unless you could prove you'd been sheriff for four lifetimes. <laughs> and you'd been developed on the job to being nice and not beating people up. And then there were still some warlords who had some armies, wanted to have a fight and do their ego game. But then the Dalai Lamas called in some Mongolians, and the Mongolians like flattened them all out and then said, and then said the Lama should be ruler. And then... The Shamdrung in Bhutan, he went down there. He ran away from some warlord, the king of Zhang, which was actually the same warlord who was trying to crush the Dalai Lama in Tibet. In fact, the Bhutanese were only thinking the Dalai Lama was their problem, but he wasn't. It was the king of Zhang. They had a common enemy, actually, the Shamdrung and the Dalai Lama. Mm. And so then he made a, he, he dealt with the warlike Bhutanese in their local tribal thing, and, he, and they became governed by a Lama. And the, the, you see, people think, Oh, then people, Western people go, ooh, theocracy. Oh, that's terrible, dreadful. Oh, that's awful. Oh, we have our democracy. And the Dalai Lama and the king of Bhutan imitated the democracy. You know? mm. But they said, oh, they're, they're, those modern people, they don't like that. They call us theocracy. But the theocracy, they're not theocracy. Buddhists don't believe in God. <laughs> they don't believe there's an omnipotent being on top of the universe, which is what theocracy requires. So mm. then some sort of a pope or some sort of a being like that has absolute power of life and death over everybody. Buddhists don't believe in that. 
Nobody's afraid of the Dalai Lama. Dalai Lama, he's like, old man in Bama Holmes, like, <laughs> what? <laughs> they go and say, oh, yes, you're holding yes, Holmes. Then they go out and have a beer. <laughs> out and back. And they don't do what he said. They don't scare of him. It's a Buddhocracy or a Lamacracy. Hmm. And what that means is that the authority in the society is headed by someone who doesn't have a family, wants to, like, raise his brat to inherit his kingdom and then make war on somebody nearby. Hmm. He doesn't have a... So his nepotism is minimized. Actually, they still have relatives, so they can be nepotistic lamas, but, but not to the same degree. Doesn't have an army, just has a bunch of monks. And mm. the monks are out there going, oh, man, pay my home. <laughs> and they're not conquering anybody. And the monk thing is you get the macho Rambo guy, and instead of going around beating his wife and everybody else over the head, you put him in a monastery, in a, in a thing, and he puts his monk robe on and sits there, and he bangs his own head against the wall. <laughs> right. Until he becomes nice. <laughs> and so that's mainstreaming it, the monasticization of the Tibeto, uh, Bhutanese culture, Ladakis, you know, whatever different things you want to call it. Monasticism is the one cure for the Rambos. When America will be demilitarized and will really be happy and the wives will be really respected and the children will be brought up peacefully is when the Pentagon is a Bhutanese monastery <laughs> and <Wow>. General Petraeus <laughs> is in there <coughs> and he's all money pay me home. <laughs> and he's not like chasing his biography around his desk, biographer around his desk. <laughs> and he's not out there trying to conquer some Iraqis and bomb them into smithereens and doing all kinds of like negative things, which are unnecessary in any way. But that's another story. I won't get into that. But I'm just saying, so you feel that in Bhutan, hmm. Bhutan is not like that anymore, but it has the residue of this vibration of where life is oriented toward joy, toward freedom. <coughs> <coughs> and this freedom is in the hearts of the people. And therefore, they're smiling. And they are doing all kinds of funny, cute things. And we kind of at first think, well, maybe it's sort of like going to, like, you know, going to, uh, to Rome under the Borgias or something. And that's been a propaganda about Tibet that the Chinese communists hired some Westerners to make. It wasn't like that. And they're not perfect either, of course. But you feel that vibe, and the artifacts come out of that vibe, and the centrality of the temple, and the weird festivals, mm. and the funny cure, the guy who comes up with a big wooden penis and runs around and demands a dollar from you. <laughs> and if you don't give it, he starts like making up all kind of weird stories, and he tells your wife, oh, I saw you chasing a nun around the building yesterday. <laughs> and, and he'll tell that to lamas. Hi, lamas. He'll say, I'm going to expose you. You're not a celibate monk. You're like this. And he has to give them some money to shut them up. Even though he just makes it up. Huh. <laughs> but they're out there to be fools and to like pay, you know, like, like uh, make a joke about the, the authorities type of thing. You know? hmm. And you feel this sort of openness in the culture. And that's why people do love it. You know? And it's in the architecture. And it's in, and it's in the fact when the king still kept his authority over the environment, which I begged him to do and not go to democracy. Because America is a theocracy. I'm sorry. You think America is a democracy? No, we worship a god in America. Do you know who's the name of that god? It's called Mammon. Mm. We're a mammonocracy. <laughs> god. And money mm. takes over when you don't have some sort of spiritual center mm. in your culture. And we've, we, it's happened to us. And it's happened, it happens in India. And when Bhutan king, mm. misguidedly thinking that he was just going to be modern and be a democracy, and he took all the power away from his son, even over the preservation of the environment, that parliament will start selling the woods like they did in India mm. and every other mm. country where, because where, parliament, you know, you have to have in a country somebody who's not for sale. We should have presidents, for example, who are not for sale. George Washington, luckily, was not for sale. Jefferson was not for sale. Mm. I'm afraid it may not be the case, sort of, now it is, but maybe, maybe, maybe we got someone. But, you know, there's that Lincoln bedroom business, you know. <laughs> very tough for someone to try to be not for sale in that position. Mm -hmm. I'm very sympathetic. Mm -hmm. Maybe they need to be for sale ahead of time, and then once they're in, like, break their contracts. <laughs> <laughs> 
and like start be treating people equally, maybe. But maybe it's not possible. They say it's not possible. I don't know. I shouldn't get into politics. Don't let me get into politics. That's all right. Every, every conversation is a pilgrimage, I've learned. Oh, OK. So, so. It, is. it is. We're on the path. It is. Um, it but is. So anyway, that's why we love Bhutan. Yeah, hearing you talk about Bhutan, do you, is there a particular image, memory, encounter that you had there that just kind of brings that spirit to, to life for you? Uh, well, yes. I think uh, in the Tamshing Monastery, where you meet this image of Padmasambhava, uh, the great uh, guru of, of that monastery, and where he, he's, he's unusual. Usually they sort of look, the, the temple images look like this, you know. But he's looking like that. And the tradition is that when the artist was, was finalizing the sculpture, that the sculpture, that Padmasambhava was in, they have a, rep, a dedication where they invoke a astral, duplicate into the statue. They have right. a ritual, so what they call dedication rituals, right. where they, it's really a beautiful thing. Because, well, this is a thing you have to understand about Buddhism. You, you wouldn't understand that. You would think they were doing idolatry, which they're not. None of them thinks that the statue is Padmasambhava. But yet, they want the real Padmasambhava to be present through the statue. So this makes sense in their culture, because unlike a Christian culture, where there is this theory that God, who is omnipotent, created the entire universe, is omnicompassionate, that he, he only allowed himself one son, one manifestation to bring his message of love and compassion to human beings. I have, I have translated for Tibetan lamas in so many interreligious conferences where they go to that lama, they, they talk to those theologians, and they say, how many children do you have? And those Lutheran theologians, they usually have four or five. He said, okay, you have five, but your omnipotent God only has one. And then there's a lot of theology. Then again, they say, isn't he omnipotent? And more theology goes on and on. Finally, that lama says to me in Tibetan, this one particular one got me in real trouble, says to me in Tibetan, I guess the old boy only had one bullet in him. <laughs> <laughs> And of course, I burst out laughing. And then <laughs> the guy is like, what did you say? <laughs> and, then, and then I have to make up something uh. like some counter theology, like, OK. I, and then I explained to him that in the Buddhist thing, uh, enlightened being, if you become a Buddha, when you become a Buddha, I shouldn't say it, you're all going to be Buddhas. And the women before the men, most likely, because they're less all egotistical in general. I mean, there are some pretty egotistical, poor little spoiled princesses. but. Basically, they're less egotistical than males are acculturated to be. And they have some biological more sense of connectedness than males. So when you become a Buddha, you have this weird experience where you suddenly feel you are everybody. It isn't a oneness thing where you feel that there is nobody and you're just floating in space. There are experiences like that, but that's not Buddhahood. That's a way station. You mustn't confuse that for Buddhahood. Buddhahood is where everybody's right here and you feel you're all of them which a little bit freaks you out. But luckily, you're in total bliss. Apparently, you only get there through a path of seeing things on the plane of where you realize everybody is made of bliss. So although they have a, like a frown on their face, and they're looking confused and perplexed and a little uncomfortable, you see them as made of bliss without knowing it. And that frustrates you. Because you feel, why shouldn't they know what their own reality is since it's good? And they're actually, even their earlobe is bliss. It's just made of bliss. The only reason the cells and the <laughs> atoms stay together on the earlobe is because they're enjoying bliss of being together. Those atoms, subatomic energy, quantum energy. You know, the quantum people, everything's flying apart. They can't find any of it. It's all it's just a probability. So your earlobe would disintegrate, and it would be out there across, like, uh, out over the Golden Gate Bridge. <laughs> but it stays on your ear because it's blissful mm. in your ear. It likes your ear. So, so when you're Buddha, you, that's the way you are. And then you have this immense energy, therefore, because you're everybody's energy. And then if anybody needs anything, you want to manifest that for them. Like in the Shantideva book, you know, the Bodhisattva vow, he says, if people need a medicine, may I be medicine. If they need food, may I be food. If they need a light, may I be a light. If they need an island, may I be an island. If they need a planet, may I be a planet. 
If Obi-Wan was a Buddha, Obi-Wan would have created a planet for the people that the Death Star destroyed on the planet. Remember the Death Star destroyed? And he mm -hmm. felt a disturbance in the Force. But if you're a Buddha, you are the whole Force. You don't create it. You're not making the mess for people, but you can do anything possible to get them out of it. And therefore, they have this concept called the emanation body, the Nirmanakaya, where Buddha can be millions of Jesuses. If people need Jesus, if they need Buddha, if they need Muhammad, if they need, if they need Mrs. Muhammad, if they need Oprah, <laughs> Buddha will be Oprah. <laughs> and he'll may do a makeover on them, <laughs> if that's what they need. No, that is, a, I mean, it's a preposterous <laughs> Buddhist vision, I grant you. And I'm mad at Buddha all the time, because where, why isn't there an emanation body running for president who's not for mm. sale? Mm. Although maybe there is, and I just don't see it. So I'm, I'm humble about that. But, but the point is that there are emanations everywhere. So, they have a, so what they do is when they make a statue of a Buddha, they then have a ritual before they paint in the eyes where they say, OK, Buddha, you can emanate anywhere, anything. You can send out Obi-Wan Kenobi <laughs> luminous light-made bodies, as many as people need. So please send a light-made duplicate, what they call a wisdom-substanced Buddha, replica of yourself, and inhabit this statue. And then at the moment when that clicks in that ritual, they then paint the eyes. And then, and then that Padmasambhava statue in this Damsheng monastery, apparently the statue itself, at the moment they clicked that and the artist was about to paint the eyes, the statue moved because he saw a Dakini. You know, Dakini means a female Buddha. They're very beautiful. I call them Ms. Buddha. And they're usually bright red in color, and they're rather scantily clad often, <laughs> I must admit, and, uh, because they want to show that there's no barrier, there's no veil between them and the reality of the bliss of the universe. And it's not, it's not anything, you know, off color at all. Well, it is bright red, actually. <laughs> Ruby color. And, and so he saw one. And then the statue moved, and his eyes flashed with huh. delight. Because he saw this female Buddha, the anima, you know, the Jungian anima. He mm. saw her. And somehow, when you see that statue, your eyes flash, and you see that. Right. You see that you're surrounded by blissful beings, and you feel a little of the Padmasambhava's bliss, the lotus-born one. So I think that was a great moment for me. Remember that trip? We had been in that village and had that wonderful ceremony there. And then we walk back to Tamjing. And then, of course, if you're, if you're feeling too much delight in that temple, the lama of that temple, Pema Lingba, he made a chain mail, a piece of chain mail that's like a cloak, chain mail cloak that weighs 30 kilo, 20, 30 kilo. And you can put that on like a flagellante. Mm. And then you do circumambulations inside the temple, feeling properly, properly this to purify your sins. You know, because you're a sinner and all this. You're like miserable. You know, they have that side too. You know. Then you feel all purified. You run around, like my son ran around three times. Time he went, and he said, "I'm all pure now. I can go sin some more." <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Probably went off to have a beer. <laughs> unfortunately, anyway. Do you have a, a pilgrimage that has special meaning for you? One that you've done in your life that you think of as the pilgrimage? Well, yes. Uh, well, every, t every pilgrimage has special meaning for me mm. nowadays because I've reached that age where I can't remember the previous one. <laughs> so each one is a new one. It's all new, and I don't worry. Like People are all terrified of Alzheimer's. Like, they shouldn't worry. So, of course, if they stressed out less, they'd have less of it. And they ate, ate less crappy milk and got less brain plaque and lowered their stress level and decided maybe one billion was enough. And this relaxed them and started enjoying giving it away, mm. then they then they would be they would be able to remember at least what's important. But who needs to remember all that nonsense? <laughs> so it's all fresh and new for me because it's, I don't remember too well. I do actually, but I do and I don't. So I'm always hoping for a new insight. Uh -huh. And um, I must say, when I come to the Bay Area, it's like a pilgrimage for me right. because right. I don't know why it is. I think well, it has to do with. Your chakras as Californians. And I think it also might have to do with the high percentage of Asian, Asian Americans in the West Coast. Mm. 
even though they, many of them may be ignorant, they might cheat you in business, whatever, I'm not saying they're all enlightened at all. They're just regular people. But they come from cultures where maybe they had a little more personal energy allowed to them in a funny way. They didn't have quite the constrictedness of the Anglo and the American Anglo who's living in denial of many things and therefore doesn't really, is nervous about feeling too much, you know? And it's socialized not to feel too much, and therefore we're all militarized, you know? We don't want to admit that we live on top. We have all our land we own and our titles, and, but our title search stops short of the Native American genocide. I'm sorry. But yet, and subliminally, we know about it. We can go and name some, in some, some baseball teams with any kind of name we want, or some automobiles. Chief so-and-so automobile, mm. to act like we're in charge of it, but we're haunted by it because we are sensitive people. We have like a conscience, mm. and we're still not. You Californians are way ahead of us in New York, where we have the Six Nations who actually should own. They have a paper they showed me where Jefferson and Washington signed a land title for the, all of the northern part of New York State. But they say, we don't want Rochester back. <laughs> <laughs> we don't even want to charge you rent. We just want you to clean it up. Hmm. And we could use some clean woods hmm. we could use. You OK? Oh, she says she wants to meditate. All right. So sorry. OK. So, uh, so I feel a pilgrimage coming here, because here we're on a, and of course, the greatest event of the 21st century, I feel, is the final meeting in brotherhood and sisterhood at the deepest level of history between the whites and the yellows. And that's, that, well, this is the great laboratory of that here in California. And the Dalai Lama's mission, and the Tibetans' mission, is a bridge between the, Euro, the Indo-Europeans and the Sino-Japanese, Sino, Sino Korean, all of the Asian people. And they, those Asian people might subliminally connect, actually, to some of our native people, like the Hopi mm. and others. You know. And racism is still alive in the consciousness, actually more so of the Russians than even the Americans. We're a little more mixed up. You know, we've, we watched Grasshopper, even mm. though mm. even the original Grasshopper should have been Bruce Lee. But at the time, they felt, oh, the yellow person will not be, mm. the American people won't really like that, so they put in What's his name? Bill, who got, finally got killed by Uma. You know, <laughs> um, believe me, the real thing in history is the meeting of all these races. Of course, we still have a problem with the black people, with the red people. There may be some purple people. I think maybe the dolphins are the blue people, oh. and the purple people. <laughs> and there's a brotherhood and sisterhood of sentient beings on this planet that we, we are the white brothers. Well, a lot of us here, not everyone here, but a lot of us here are. And the meeting with them is the major event of this century, mm. to meet them in brotherhood and sisterhood and be able to share the planet with them. That doesn't mean being conquered by them. And it doesn't mean conquering them and, and, and exporting our polluting industries to them to wreck their environment instead of continuing to wreck our environment. Mm. It means meeting in a way where we're all meeting with nature, where we're all Californian. We all like to take a walk in the afternoon. We all like. Like you Californians, you're all suntan and you're like happy. <laughs> and you're intermarrying with Asians, and it's wonderful. It's marvelous. It's creating a new breed. It's fabulous. So I feel it's kind of like a pilgrimage to come here and a special nice. meeting for me. Somehow, I always felt too guilty to leave our uptight scene in New York. I was born in Manhattan. I feel I should, I should make Manhattan happier. <laughs> Very hard. Yes. <laughs> yes. In New York. But that's my job. So I kind of feel bound. Many times we've toyed with coming here, wow. where we feel people are naturally more happy. But we feel you've got to bring everybody along with you. you know? mm. And uh, You would and, be most welcome here. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> I thank you. I love being here. And then, and then I, would like, I would like to take all of you with me. We would all go together. In, I've had a, I used to have a recurring dream. I haven't had it lately, unfortunately, although I think the time is getting close. But I used to have a recurring dream, a very vivid, one of those technicolor dreams that you remember, so I, maybe I don't need to have it more frequently. But I had it many times, actually, where 
I'm with the Dalai Lama, and we're in a giant dirigible. But it's not going to burn like the Graf Zeppelin something. It's made some, you know, like ecological way. And we're floating down, actually from the north, coming from the Mongolia side. And we're floating down into Tibet. And it's legal, and the Chinese are welcoming and happy. And the Tibetans are flipping with joy, and they're dancing in celebration. And the Dalai Lama is floating there. And it's a big dirigible, and you can all be on that dirigible. And then we get down off the dirigible at different places, and they have festivals. And, you know, they do their own Manipema homes and their dances and the blessings and the radiations and the visualizations. And we're floating down toward the Potala. You know. And then somehow, I, I, we've never, in the dream, it's never quite moored the, moored the, the, um, the dirigible on the Potala you know, mm. and going down that. We haven't wow. quite reached there. Wow. And, he won't be content just to go to Potala. He actually didn't like the Potala that much. What he really likes is the Norbalinka, the garden there. And then that dirigible, when the thing happens in reality, it will turn eastward and it will float down. We'll all go down and we'll do a Kala Chakra for world peace. The time machine, the wheel of time for world peace in Tiananmen Square. Wow. And, uh, <laughs> and the king of, you know, the emperor of China, the seven-man Politburo, will partially democratize China, not chaotically, but systematically and pleasantly democratize China, decentralize power, let China be decentralized like, like a federation, you know, like, like countries should be. You shouldn't have capitals. The idea that a capital somewhere, like a Washington, knows what's best environmentally for people in Oregon or California is a bad idea. There should be decentralization of power where people can control their own environment, who understand their own environment. And particularly, people who are in charge of the water tower of Asia, where all the rivers of 3.5 billion people, including the Chinese, come from, should be in charge of keeping those headwaters clean and cool and not melting the glaciers 50 times faster than they're supposed to melt by trying to industrialize and create big cities and occupy and sort of own the land in some asinine industrial military way. But that could be in federation with China. It would be China's own park, and they'd be getting like Nobel Peace Prizes and Sierra Fund Prizes, whatever they want. <laughs> they would be giving out these prizes and help them clean up their own environment, which we have encouraged them to pollute to an exaggerated degree. It's not their fault. Mm. We did that. Larry Summers wrote a paper for the World Bank years ago, in which he said, the only way to keep up our model of industrial capitalism and growth is to export all our polluting industries to third world countries that can't say no. Hmm. He wrote a paper like that. And I think Wolfson fired him. But then, you know, he keeps getting hired. He fails at one job, and he gets hired by another person. Hmm. And he's like, the, he's like the most successful serial failure in world history. <laughs> 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 at least he didn't get the Fed, uh -huh. finally. So, I'm sorry, I should stay out of politics, I know. <laughs> I hate Democrats. <laughs> I hate the Democrats for their MSNBC, don't worry. I like real Republicans who preserve the environment, I do. Real ones, not fake ones, real ones. Mm. Teddy Roosevelt. We need Teddy Roosevelt. Go ahead and beat, the, beat Wall Streeters with a stick. <laughs> really. And send them all out for an internship as a park rangers in Yosemite. <laughs> and, then, and then Lloyd Blankfein can really do God's work, preserving Yosemite. Yeah. I, I have one Dem pilgrimage question. Democrats <laughs> suck. <laughs> okay, yes, what? No. So uh, that's my pilgrimage that's to America. Great. And in America, we'll have the, the, here in California, you'll have pilgrimage, play, the, you'll go to Tassajara yeah. on foot or right. on a bicycle. And then from Tassajara, you'll go over to Boulder Creek, to all the different, uh, Vajrapani, the Tibetan Buddhist Center, and then the Land of Medicine Buddha down in Soquel. Right. And then you'll come up here, and you're at San Jose, and then you'll go to, to Larry Ellison's like Japanese stupa there, and you'll have uh -huh. tea ceremony with Larry Ellison. Right. Perfect. After he's finally finished conquering the, it by creating like an like a, like a, like a ice boat on water to win the World Cup, he will like finally become an expert tea. He'll start competing in tea ceremony. Right. You go and have exactly. tea ceremony with Larry Ellison. And then right. in Silicon Valley will be like a holy place. And you'll have great ones. We'll have them in the Catskills in New York. 
Okay. There are many pilgrimage like places here. We'll have mm -hmm. the Super Bliss Buddha will show up here. When Bold, Boulder, Colorado, Woodstock, New York, Mill Valley, Boulder Creek, these will all be holy places. And your when children, your children will revel in that. And we'll cool down this planet. And it'll all be solar energies in the, from the all being pumped up in a high-tech, beautiful backbone coming from, from the, uh, the, what is that, desert? You know, you have a big desert there. What's it called? Death Valley. Death Valley. You have huge solar array there. Pump the electricity all the company. You know that my Angela, you know, Angela Merkel should be an example to us all. Did you know that? Angela has turned off all the nukes since Fukushima. She just turned them off. Bang. And you know what? I read a thing in the Financial Times. You wouldn't even believe it. They're so complaining, the finance people. Oh, electricity is getting so cheap. Now the, wow. the, the stock value of all those coal-burning, polluting electric uh, generators is, is going way down, and all the pension funds are in there. We won't be able to survive, you know? And we won't be able to pay everybody's pension because they're all having cheap electricity. There's now so much already in Germany. It's not California. It's Germany, there's enough solar and wind to get everybody going. Electricity is too cheap. What kind of people are complaining that the power is too cheap? What do they think? Clean power is too cheap. What? They can like, make money doing something else. There's a lot of money to be made, like grow some organic like soybeans <laughs> that are not genetically modified and make money at that. Come on. They can make money opening beautiful spas. Medicine Buddha Spa in every town. Like ours in the Catskill, we can be the model. We're going to franchise. No golden arches. <laughs> There'll be deep blue, deep blue mandalas <laughs> instead of golden arches. So I, I have one last question. Oh, OK. <laughs> I get the last. Three I get the, the meaning question. of the last. <laughs> but anyway, but no, I'm inviting you all onto the dirigible with me. Yes. And we're coming. In the future. We're coming. And we'll all float in there when Xi Jinping turns China around and they decide Dalai Lama is their heart jewel, their crown mm. jewel. And he's their first Nobel Peace Prize. Mm. And then they'll let Liu Xiaobo out of prison. Hopefully, he won't be malnourished by then. And they'll, he'll be their second Nobel Peace Prize. And then we'll all confer on their president the third Nobel Peace Prize. Mm. Xi Jinping can have it. If he just wises up and shuts down the people who are like Neanderthal public relations, who, have, who signed up on the Neanderthal public relations firm, because <laughs> they think that's giving them good advice. <laughs> And giving them the, and again, we'll give them good. We'll give them good advice. We'll have GOX public relations. There we go. And we'll have all of you giving out the public <laughs> relations about how to how to get make more money being nice. Okay. Here's my question. Yes. What's your question? <laughs> Last question. Looking I looking know. back at your your life, all the pilgrimages you've made, what's the what's the purpose of a pilgrimage? The purpose of a pilgrimage is to be, to remind yourself of your own innate happiness to such a degree that you can take whatever purpose it is with a grain of salt. And you can sort of be here now. Thank you, Baba Ramdas. But where, but where the here and the now is not some dead zone of disconnectedness, disconnected, egocentric, psychotic isolation. But the now is filled with an infinity of positive energy, creating better worlds for an infinity of people who want a better world. So it's connected to relative reality to everybody else. So that's what the pilgrimage is. It's to be happy. As I said, in my Why the Dalai Lama Matters book, at the end, when the Simon & Schuster publisher asked me to give 10 points of hope, to make up 10 points of hope, which were, had to do with Tibet, but also with life. And then my final thing is my, what I like to say to a bunch of people who are feeling a little bit cheered up, that the, from the Buddha's point of view, which is not a religious thing, you can be, Buddha doesn't want you to give up grand, your grandmother's religion. That just, by the way, I just want to say, because it will make grandmother unhappy. So whatever you learn from Buddha in the, in the Buddha school, which is not a religion, actually. Buddhism is mainly a religion for people who don't go to the Buddhist school. Mm. And they just believe that it's a good school. So it's for them, it's religion. But the people who start going to the education and use the psychology and the science, 
It's a service. Buddhism is a service. So the Buddha's suggestion to us is that it is our duty to find our own inner happiness and to be really happy and to find such a huge happiness that even if they kill us, we will die happy. Do you ever hear the expression, I'm so happy I could die? Mm. Well, the way not to be afraid of terrorists and not to be brainwashed into supporting a police state is to be so happy that you don't fear even being killed. But you, that doesn't mean you seek it. You defend yourself, and you do it from a happy point of view. But you don't have that, ni that nightmare anxiety that, who if I don't have 17 locks and 14 and throw everybody of the wrong class into prison at youth, you know, I, I'll be, I won't be safe. So you're driven by fear. You won't have to be driven by that fear because you'll be so happy. Even you'll be happy to be afraid. And even you die, you'll die happy. That's my, that's my mm. final, that's the Buddha's final teaching to us. Mm. You'll die happy. Because when you die, what tells you where you go is the degree of happiness in your soul. And the only way to be happy in your soul, you will not be happy in your soul by getting a lot of money. You will not be happy in your soul by having a huge family. You will not be happy in your soul by owning a lot of things. You will not be happy in your soul even by many kind of relationships. The only way you'll be happy in your soul is if you find the happiness in your soul, which is the wisdom and love in your own soul. Mm -hmm. Loving all, everyone. And because of being wise and realizing that you are connected to them and that their happiness is your best happiness. Because the great thing about when you make them happy, the kind of happiness you get from making them happy, is you don't know, you're, you're not them when they think of how happy am I? Because then they're going to not be happy enough. <laughs> Whatever you do for them. Mm. But while you're enjoying their happiness, you don't stop to think of how happy am I? Mm. The minute you think that, you're not going to be happy enough. So as Dalai Lama says, if you want to be successfully selfish, be a wise selfish, and be compassionate and loving to others. Because that was what, when you're compassionate and loving to others, the first person who gets happy is yourself. But if you're trying to just make yourself happy, you'll be miserable. That's the key, that's the secret teaching. I know that's, that's the last question, so thank you all very much. Thank you. And all the best. And we'll go on to our first together. Thank you. And uh, I'm supposed to be promoting, I'm promoting a book I wrote with Sharon Salzberg called Love Your Enemies. And the real title that I didn't quite keep was Because It Will Drive Them Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but then the publisher talked me out of it because she thought some Christian people might feel it was rude. Although I took it from a sermon announcement. You know, you see those on those billboards outside of churches. <laughs> and it was a sermon. A black church had that as a sermon uh, title. That's great. And then they put something about be happy and don't be angry. You know, as a, they put as a subtitle. So I'm promoting that book. So look at that book, all you non-angry Californians. It, it's for sale. It will be oh, for I sale. Oh, I hope so. After. Oh, good. And then the second thing I have to promote, or my wife won't let me come home, is please be Tibet House members. A lot of you who travel already are Tibet House members. I hope you're getting your newsletters and you're keeping up your membership. And if not, complain. Please complain. So we catch up with you. OK, and now we quit. And we, what do we do now, Brent? OK. Gonna... <laughs> what do we do? Don't lose my the passport. The auction. Mention the auction. What are you going to tell me now? Don't lose my passport? <laughs> the what? The auction. Oh, the auction. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Brent and Nina. December 16th in Tristie's in New York, if any of you are back and forth by Coastals. We're having a charity auction for Tibet House, and we need people who want to get last-minute Hanukkah, Christmas bargains. And there are trips there even, I believe there will be a GOX trip, a donated trip. You can get a discount on it, although you might bid it up even in a, in a giddy <laughs> mood, which we would love. And uh, so December 16th at Christie's, okay, our benefit auction. Anything else I should promote? 
I, I just want to say, on behalf of GOX, thank you so much for leading tours for us. Well, thank you, Don. Thank, well, thank you very you much. Leading tours. Uh, I want to go on one of yours <laughs> to Japan. That's a deal. Shikoku. I want to go with him on his tour to Shikoku. OK. Because I did go there once in the 80s, but we didn't really do it enough and do it right. And it's a beautiful tour. Though. I'll go to Bhutan with you. You come to Shikoku OK, with that's me. a deal. And thank you for gracing us with your wisdom tonight. Well, thank you. Thank, and thank you, so you all much. for gracing me by coming down tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you.